Welcome everybody to our very last session of our Navigating New Norms uh, short course this year. Our last session will be uh, Employing Generative AI in Libraries, taught by our speaker and instructor, Fred Lapola. Just as a reminder, these are all the sessions that we've completed. Again, those materials will be made available um, after we uh, complete the course and process all of those materials. So Fred Lapola is the head of the NYU Health Sciences Library's Data Services Team and chairs their AI Working Group. He serves as liaison to the Departments of General Internal Medicine and Clinical Innovation and Radiology. Fred also teaches rigor and reproducibility and R programming in the Grossman School of Medicine, Vilcek Institute of Graduate Biomedical Sciences. He is passionate about professional and education and finding ways to facilitate learning around data collection, management, visualization, and analysis. Fred holds a Master's of Library Science from Queens College CUNY, and we are very excited to start this talk. So Fred, please take it over. Thank you. Good afternoon and good late morning to those on the West Coast, I think. Uh, welcome to today's session, the final of four. My name is Fred Lopola. I'm a head of data services here at NYU Langone Health and sharing our AI working group here at the NYU Health Sciences Library. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking through, as so in the past sessions, we've talked about generally what is AI, the ethics of AI, uh, tried out different systems. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about how different libraries are using AI, bearing in mind, you know, it's relatively early days. I do sort of use the term broadly. Some of these papers refer to machine learning techniques that we'll be going through. Uh, but yeah, we'll be going through some things that are going on to hopefully give you a broader scope of activity in the library world as it pertains to generative AI and really particularly the medical library world. Uh, I do have the chat and the questions open. As always, please add any of your questions. I'm not sure if he's just said this to the Q&A feature. Uh, we'll be looking at those. If you have you know technical issues, of course, add them to the chat. We do have them both open, but the chat, as you can imagine, with 193 people can move very quickly. So more substantive things. Happy to try to answer those, but definitely add them to the Q&A. Hopefully we can keep things, I mean, within the scope of a giant course as conversational and free flowing as possible. Uh, so don't feel like you shouldn't ask questions. I'll also occasionally have some uh, feedback sessions using a tool called Slido and we'll get to those when we get to those. So hopefully by the end of today's session, you'll have a sense of, you'll be able to describe how generative AI might be incorporated to enhance library services. You'll be able to identify services that can use generative AI, such as text generation, chat, and recommendation ranking systems, and identify benefits and challenges of implementing generative AI in libraries. Hmm. Yeah, it's probably because I just moved forward uh, to the question, Alex, for the thing. Uh, I am also going to skip this question, um, though I am a little bit curious, but again, I'm going to skip it. So as was discussed in previous sessions, there are different tasks that AI may bene be beneficial for using. So often here kind of at the NYU Langone system, when we talk about AI, we really talk about in a few different contexts. Searching, though searching is not really here being used in the uh, library context. Here what we mean is perhaps finding information or language in a large body of text. Uh, so we might think of this in the sense of, you know, is this information contained? So sort of a very advanced version, a natural language version of doing essentially your control F or your search within a body of text, but being able to find more complex pieces of information within that text. So I know I've heard uh, from some individuals in our uh, legal department that they may use it to see if certain information is within different uh, legal contracts for compliance purposes, for, for example. Also very good at summarizing, so condensing a large body of information into maybe a more uh, reader-friendly uh, use case, extracting, pulling out information from something. And that could also mean things like the tone of, lang of text as well as sort of the material that's factually there, verifying that a body of text contains some information, categorizing text in some way. And again, that could refer to things such as sentiment, uh, could refer to types of documents, 
uh, as we'll talk about in a bit, and it could also refer to classifying things as relevant or not in the context of a search and changing text in some way, so transforming. So it could mean putting things in simpler language, for example, could potentially mean translating between languages. So definitely we'd want to be really thinking about, you know, do we have the secondary language uh, confidence to, if we're going to do that, be able to check the work. And of course, generating original text content. And it may also, and uh, if we're talking about something like a copilot, be talking about image based. So things like Dolly, for example. Uh, so it doesn't have to just be text. Uh, let's see. Sure, the slides will be shared after this session. Uh, and yeah, happy to share these as we go forward. But that's good feedback. I'll definitely slow down a bit. So I will kind of go through some of the different areas that libraries are working with AI broadly. <coughs> Excuse me. So increasingly libraries are using them within their to identify their resources and catalogs and collections. Uh, so there's a really great integrative review that came out earlier this year. Uh, by Lund et al. And they're really looking at different ways libraries are using uh, using tools such as ChatGPT and large language models within their service model. So they discuss a few different things. They talk about the use of chatbots. And I know here at Langone, this is something we're exploring. Uh, so seeing if perhaps there can be ways to uh, employ chatbots to, for example, guide users through the resources with perhaps not needing the same level of understanding of you know the finer points of database searching so i know for many individuals here being able to use natural language is very appealing there also uh lund uh they note that it's being used in reference and navigation in research and writing uh there is a link on the last slide <laughs> in the uh citation uh so those will all be there i will definitely mention a fair amount of papers today they are all in the citations um Though I guess you could also view it as the librarian challenge. Maybe I'll just give you vague, vague hints and you can track them down. But that's not actually my goal. It's just that the citations are on the last page. Uh, so they also note some of the challenges. So there's definitely anxieties over job loss, as well as opportunities in providing the human contact point and helping users navigate new tools. And maybe I'm sort of putting my mm, editorial spin, which maybe I would put at the end up front here. I'll definitely say, well, I understand definitely where these sort of anxieties can come from. I also feel like a lot of these chat GPT type tools, these LLMs, a lot of working with them, you know, comes down to creating effective prompts, understanding what you can get out of them in terms of what sorts of service they provide. And so I feel like there's a very close parallel to guiding users to how to use databases. And of course, we wouldn't use a chat GPT to be a database. The information, it's not, you know, providing up to date, unbiased information, but we can sort of view it as a tool that we can educate our users in. So I do think that there's a lot of these opportunities for librarians to sort of build upon existing, uh, you know, existing things that <laughs> services that libraries and librarians have a lot of experience with. Uh, just seeing somebody saying they had somebody ask if they were human or not during <laughs> a chat session. So yeah, fair enough. Uh, hopefully it didn't mean you were <laughs> communicating very, you know, robotically though. I mean, we've all could easily be fooled. Uh, yeah. So some things that they note, they do actually provide a framework within their paper for kind of thinking about how one might evaluate the use of AI. So defining, of course, beginning defining your evaluation criteria, curating a test data set, creating realistic scenarios where you might be using AI as you would in the workplace, engaging everyone, assessing the accuracy, evaluating the contextual understanding that's provided and testing it out with specialized information, measuring response size, gathering feedback and documenting and reporting findings. So I definitely recommend checking this out because this framework I found to be nice in terms of them walking through. If you're thinking of adopting uh, you know, if you're thinking of adopting AI in some context in your library, I think it's really nice to have this sort of written out framework. And a lot of this, of course, is not necessarily new or limited to this paper, but it was nice that within the context of this broader discussion, they do provide uh, a lot about this. Uh, so yeah, so 
Similarly, within uh, a, a different paper by Adeteo last year, they were looking at student surveys. So they found that many of the students did like the interface of using, this was in the context of chatbots within a library, that they did really like the interface and convenience. Uh, but they also felt that there were challenges around it, understanding complex questions. So again, to that point, there was a lot of um, a lot of uh, you know benefit from the standpoint of liking how it worked, and a lot of need for that still that extra level of support around using this, since it couldn't really help with these complex questions. Where again, it might not be the tool necessarily for that uh, for that you know, for depending on what you're trying to do. If you're trying to find, a, you know, do a complex literature search, large language models, at least currently, are not, you know, what you would need. You would need the actual literature databases. So in terms of things that have been done, uh, I've de we've definitely been hearing about different work being done at different libraries. These are just sorts of things to think about. Maybe they would be beneficial in your context. Maybe they would not be appropriate. So uh, we've heard a bit about experimental work being done at Harvard. Uh, to work with the their text metadata and actually help their end users locate the physical resources within the building. So the idea would be less, okay, go find, you know, you're looking for this book on <laughs> generative AI and libraries. Here is either the, uh, you know, the Dewey classification or the Library of Congress classification or whatever system they happen to use. Go look at a map and figure it out. But instead, providing a little bit higher level support for end users who maybe would be frustrated otherwise or would take them longer to use those sort of non-plain language ways of approaching. Uh, so I'm not sure if there's been if there have been reports on how well that's gone. My understanding is it is sort of in an experimental phase, not saying that they've published on their site, but something to be aware of. Uh, we at NYU have also been working to explore uh, using chatbots, using different systems, thinking about it for things like first line ticket triaging and identifying the correct pathways for different types of requests. Uh, so, you know, if it sees that the language seems to relate to a data services request, forwarding people that way, if it seems to be a literature search, sending people to our uh, education and uh, clinical research groups. So trying to figure out things as they go along. And again, really hopefully being able to offer that plain language interface for our end users. And both of these cases really rely on AI to extract information from the catalog or library sites and transform it from a technical information to plain language for users who maybe you know, don't have the experience, don't have the interest in the more uh, formal, uh, you know, either figuring out the different systems and hopefully can save them some time. Uh, it can also be employed in library guides. So, a colleague of mine here, David D. Simone, who is very interested in working with AI, has actually been using this a bit to uh, help update and create live guides that sort of uh, interactively pull information from different databases. So in this case, let's see, here it goes, just oh, RSS feed error. Of course, when I go to show it, there's an error here. Uh, and I know there are other pages that have, let's just see. Always good to have the technical issues on the day you go live, but basically working with APIs. And it was information he was not, you know, didn't have a background in coding, uh, but was able to create really interactive live guides providing very up-to-date information because of the assistance when working within the system. So, yeah, so I'm actually curious, do you all have views or attitudes on this idea of an AI-enhanced catalog? and what benefits, what drawbacks there might be if you were to work in this domain. Again, you can either scan the QR or go to slido.com. Seems like maybe it's not 100% working for everyone. Let's see, the slido number isn't correct. Hmm, I don't know what to do about that. Although at least one person's typing. So I don't know if the code, if the number isn't working, then I'm not sure that there's a lot that we can do. If not, I mean, you know, this is just to be, uh, you know, just to, what, what do you call it? Try it out today. It seems that for some it's working, others it's not. It's always good to have technology throw you for a loop during a session on technology. Uh, I guess it's slightly better. Uh, Peace was sharing with me a video of somebody whose chair broke as they were beginning a session, which now sort of haunts my imagining, especially this chair creaks a lot. So if I suddenly fall to the floor, uh, 
you know, that could be an issue. Curious to see how it'll affect critical thinking to navigate the library. Valid. Uh, yeah, what about when it doesn't work? Yeah, as we've seen, there's definitely issues. Oh, yeah, somebody mentioned hallucinations. So hallucinations, I've been hearing, I forget what other terms, but yeah, basically incorrect information. Uh, that could definitely be a source of major frustration if it's like, go to the fifth floor and turn right and it's wrong and you're suddenly in like the bathroom. That would be frustrating. Granted, I've also personally had the similar frustration of either the actual text is missing, which I guess wouldn't really be impacted by this, but you know, nothing, no system will be perfect because there are these huge issues. Let's see, just going through. I like the idea better than using ChatGPT due to the issues of incorrect information. There will be good and bad, could be the future. Staff training and growing kids. Yeah, money may be a barrier for some. Yeah, I mean, I think that raises a great point. A lot of this, of course, is going to create probably entrench the same sorts of divisions of you know places with lots of resources, places without. Um, I don't really have any solutions for that. But yeah, it's something to be aware of that there are these huge costs that go into it. And yeah, it will then allow those who have to, what do you call it? You know, have it uh, and those who don't uh, to not. Let's see, make it easier to find specific sensation could impact censorship. I'm interested in, in that, but don't have to go into if you don't want to, but I'm curious what you mean. Let's see. Yeah, bad data in the catalog results in frustration. I think that's probably always going to be a challenge uh, just as things go through. It's interesting. It's giving me sort of the common words. I guess these these ones aren't so, whoops, mind blowing. Oh no. Ah, okay. Let's see, it's still typing. I don't know if I just shut it down for everyone. Uh, so yes, apologies to those for whom the system is not working today. It seems like there's, yeah, always a bit of challenge. Um, mesh head yeah, it does bad with mesh headings uh, when you try to ask them for it. I totally agree. Let's see. Yeah, I've seen that too with perplexing consensus being limited. Uh, we recently have been exploring a tool called site.ai, S-C-I-T-E.ai, and they do have agreements with some of the um, some of the big publishers, and so it's. There is some movement in that space, but yeah, it's like anything. And of course, we hear about companies like Scopus trying it out. Uh, and though there was an article, I think, in the Scholarly Kitchen that was not so enamored. Ooh, there's a, anonymous questions in the chat. So let's see. Unclear if LMs are connected to library resources or if they are exclusive behind a paywall. So it would really depend on the institution's setup. So here, for example, at uh, NYU, there's a lot of exploration of a tool called, or a subset of tools called Copilot Studio, wherein you can link your, so Copilot in this context basically means a chatbot assistant, uh, where you can basically link a chatbot assistant to a website. And my understanding is you can, if you have the API keys, you could link it to an API. So you could, uh, have it be sort of the user interface. And of course, this is not a free service, uh, but in that case, it would be actually connected to the library resources. So my understanding is in the case of the Harvard project, their LLM was actually, excuse me, uh, you know, actually connected to, I think they have a um, an Aleph instance there. Oh wait, now there's a correction. So I should have just read both. I was like, oh, two separate questions. Uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. Just trying to rationale beyond using other models since we may need to go back and validate the outputs, thereby reducing efficiency per time. Maybe I'm only answering the first half. Uh, I think it would be yeah, kind of a question as to what was the uh, the resource in question. So there, there. Are, my understanding is in the case of these studies where they've been or these projects having the uh, chat interfaces interact with the actual websites, it is using an API. Uh, which is basically just a system, essentially a, a language with wherein these computer programs, such as your catalog and your AI system, can talk to one another. Uh, so that is my understanding of how they work. But yeah, I think there it is also good to be aware that because of the need to validate the information and go back and check, it can uh, create issues. Let's see. Um, 
but yeah, so yeah, there's these challenges of, you know, it might impact people's ability to search, but then if it's what the patrons are expecting, you know, that may be what's needed. So it's probably like anything, there's going to be a bit of trade-offs and a bit of, um, you know, the end user, if they feel that they're finding things more effectively and that's what they are expecting, that's probably where they would use. But yeah, it will, of course, create challenges uh, within both costs and, you know, some skills may become less important, some skills may become more important going through. So it may require less upfront ability to compose a search, but more ability to sort of troubleshoot when you're getting the wrong information out. Uh, okay, I'm going to keep going. I wonder if I'll get through everything today. Uh, it's 2.30 already, but that's fine. I mean, there's not really a hard and fast, we must get through, you know, anything. This is more, I think, more to really get some ideas flowing and maybe see, do these use cases make sense for you? Do they not make sense for you? So library event programming. I'll definitely note this section is probably me uh, talking the most about my own experience. So I personally find it's very useful in the context of creating class plans and syllabi. So this could be things like, you know, hour long workshops. So here at Langone at Health Sciences, at the Health Sciences Library at Langone, we do a lot of workshops, both in the data services arena, things like FedCap, things like AI, uh, data visualization workshops. We do, we have workshops on uh, what I think it was like the bread and butter core librarian topics, you know, PubMed searching, create, creating an effective search, what is a systematic review, um, what is a citation management tool, as well as some curricular teaching in various capacities amongst different people. So I suspect that is not unique and that you yourself may have some form of education. And I find it can be really helpful to use these tools to help sort of expedite my class creation. Uh, I sometimes will use these for the overall, though, to be honest, you know, the overall class plan and syllabi, the overall uh, flow. To be honest, most of the time, that's like more clear to me up front that I know, okay, this is what I want to cover. But that said, I definitely know people who do use it in this capacity. So we might say, you know, you're an instructional designer providing it with its role, helping to create a class on generative AI, uh, draft a lesson plan for a 90 minute session on use cases of AI in medical libraries. It's entirely possible that this was the actual prompt that led to this workshop. I don't remember at this point. This was, you know, like anything, it was a bit of an iterative process. And a lot of what you're seeing sort of came up with, came out from what was the result of my own, you know, background literature search. But it can be nice just to sort of get past that blank page anxiety, uh, you know, getting into things. Um, yeah, don't use it all the time, but when I'm feeling out of interesting ideas, I totally hear that, uh, Rosemary commenting in the chat. Um, yeah, I mean, I think to, uh, if, uh, either Bradley Jeanette or Jeanette Bradley's, uh, point, yeah, this question of serendipity, I mean, I think there is something you said, if it's guiding you to the physical resources more quickly, you may, you know, encounter things in the context of a digital library. So we here at NYU are an all digital library maybe less of a end use case. But that said, just generally, I mean, I think it's still the case. I've encountered things serendipitously just, you know, in PubMed, in education source with Eric. So it can be very beneficial uh, there. Let's see. Just seeing, oh yeah, planning. Uh, Hepstein wrote, using it for planning or online presentations. So yeah, it can be nice just to sort of get you past that, like, uh, what am I going to do in this session? Let me check my email six times before I actually dig in. I don't know if that's a problem for you. I'm not saying it's a problem for me, but I'm not saying it's not a problem for me. So it can be nice in that context. Uh, it can also be helpful similarly uh, to providing learning outcomes, especially putting things using things like the Bloom's taxonomy verbs. Bloom's taxonomy, if you're not familiar with that, basically they're kind of like action-oriented verbs. Uh, so the idea would be your learning outcome. So what the student's supposed to kind of get out of the class uh, you know, that there are things that are measurable, things that are achievable in the course of the class. So, because because it can be kind of, you know, hard to say, by the end, you'll understand what AI is. That, that could mean anything. But if I said, by the end, you'll be able to identify a use case of AI, uh, that might be, you know, you we could test you, we could give you a quiz and see if you can identify it. So that's just what Bloom's refer to. If you Google it or, you know, search in your uh, your source of choosing. There's a lot of actually good live guides. I forget now 
a big, probably the top hit will be a big education program. I want to say Indiana, but I could be wrong. And that will list all of these verbs. But yeah, basically being able to say, okay, I want this in this context. Here's the, what's going to be in the course, just because it can kind of help. I, I definitely am aware that coming up with sort of achievable or measurable or what's the term, like smart goal type uh, outcomes can be a challenge, definitely. So providing those in. I mean, I'll definitely know in full transparency, I did have it actually help me put my, I knew what I wanted to like achieve over the year, but I was like, how can I put this in like smart terms? So it can be nice again, to sort of put these outcomes, put these goals in, uh, you know, kind of the, the language you need it to be. So maybe it's kind of like a translation use case. And actually probably by far, the number one use case in this in this context of classes and library programming that I use it in will be providing uh, or helping me write my formative assessments. So as a best practice, it can be really good if you're teaching, you know, you're teaching MESH, you're teaching your PubMed session to make sure the students understand as well as to sort of uh, help cement the learning to ask questions where they have to say, okay, this is, you know, MESH is what? And for me, actually, that's a great example case, because if I said, OK, I know Mesh, you know, is the official tagging system used by the NLM for the for for PubMed. But then if I said, OK, what are three, you know, two to three other choices that sound even remotely plausible? It's really where I start to stumble and come up short. So I find it can be so helpful in that context to say, OK, we've got our questions so we can say, help me write a question. So here again, we're providing the role you're an instructional designer to create a class on Gen AI. So we could substitute, substitute in, you know, creating a class on PubMed searching, draft a multiple question about what is the definition of mesh, provide three wrong answers and one correct answer. And if you don't know, return, you know, IDK or some something to sort of have an out. Let's see, uh, put info in. Oh yeah, so yeah, I'll definitely, let's see. Um, so yeah, so definitely, uh, worth trying out i find it can really save me some time especially because coming up with you know not super obvious uh quizzes and formative assessment type questions can be super it can be super time consuming so it can really save me some time and i i that's sort of why i'm bringing it up i think i got this idea from there's a paper by Molik and Molik, which i'm not sure actually cited in this uh subset but they're at i believe wharton uh and they have got this paper, something to the effect of like five ways to use generative AI in the classroom. And uh, it can really be beneficial. Actually, I'm wondering if this five is actually just the citation for that paper. Definitely, actually, I would say probably was the thing that got me from being like, oh, I don't know about this AI stuff to me like, oh, okay, I've, I see the use case in my actual work. Uh, this is really nice for me. <laughs> um, leaving aside the broader, you know, ethical challenges, but yeah, being able to come up with those in a sort of effective way, because it's not really helping anybody if like, you know, I say, you know, is mesh the official tagging system of the NIH or is it, you know, like how you describe a fence or is it, I don't know what. Um, so that can be really helpful there. Uh, and I mean, I'll definitely note that the context of mesh for me uh, or the concept of searching for me has been super helpful to have these quizzes and these formative assessments. Uh, I mean, just basically for the longest time, I would feel like I taught a session with students and then I would look at, for example, homework or look at, you know, the after effect and realize nobody had gotten it or like 60% were confused on and versus or. So having these sort of ongoing assessments to help yourself understand can really save you some headaches so you know where to, um, to kind of go. It's very important, of course, in all of the above cases to always remember to check for uh, incorrect information. I see that uh, Krista League has raised a hand. Um, I don't know what, <laughs> I'll leave that to the, uh, the the TA group to either help unmute or let's see, maybe I can do it. Nope, I just made it disappear. Oh, it was by accident. Was accident. Yeah, you did. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so somebody in the previous answer session definitely noted the challenge of hallucinations. I feel like I heard some even more cumbersome term like confabulations you know there's these different terms basically the problem of getting wrong but realistic looking information out of your uh large language model uh and it you'll probably have to iterate and you know uh 
work with these to get them correct. I'll definitely know even just when the information is fine, definitely I feel like it entails a high degree of uh, editing or saying, okay, that's not quite what I want or the wording there's a little bit so, so. So it's not like it's sort of replacing you in your work. You still need to, of course, A, check for factual accuracy and B, check for uh, just that it actually is providing the information you want it to or asking or quizzing the information you want it to. Um, yeah, so all different ways to think about these sort of, uh, you know, amorphous, incorrect pieces of information. So yeah, we could actually even try it. Maybe somebody wants to try uh, creating the prompt Let's say you wanted to have uh, ChatGPT to create a quiz questions about when to use the Boolean operator or maybe let's see if anybody has ideas for a prompt. Maybe I'm again throwing everybody into this chaotic system. At least one person got in. Okay, so this prompt suggests when to use the Boolean operator. And we could even try some of these out. I can open up the AI. Let's see. Whoops, sorry. I'm going to say I want to keep it active, but let's say I open up, I'll open up the NYU chat GPT instance. I'll log in slowly. So let's see. The first one was just jumping back to our slides. I guess I have to actually view it. Maybe I've created chaos. Explain the best uses for Boolean operator. Or maybe I'll uh, do this here. And again, we're we're going to ask it for uh, creating quiz questions. So yeah, we see you are a librarian teaching students how to search databases, create a quiz question about appropriate use of the Boolean operator, create a multiple choice quiz question about correct use of or the Boolean operator. Your instructional learner, create a quiz question that requires students to demonstrate an understanding of Boolean operator or offering three wrong answers and one right answer. So of course I like this one. I've, I mean, I'm biased and similar to the ones I was providing, but this can be nice because we're being really specific saying, you know, providing the role, providing the expected output, providing the overall, uh, let's see, going through. So different options. I'm actually curious if they will really come up different. So I'm going to do a screenshot because I have to navigate to the other screen. I'll move this off to my other window, which is of course hidden by 8 billion things. And we could even try it out as a group. Let's just scroll up, see, provide three examples. See so yeah, we're seeing different similar things. But yeah, I'll jump over. Whoops. Oh, I just deleted it. I'll just not worry about it. But yeah, we could try these out on our own and see how the different answers come up. Um, actually, I do really want to try it live just to see what we get. And we can jump over and we can say, let's try the first one. I am teaching a class about Boolean searching. Let's see, what is the end part of this? Create a question. Oh, wow. I need to learn how to type better, especially as I do this live. Create a question that quizzes students uh, on when to use or submit, and we'll see what we get. The wheel is spinning. Okay. In which of the following scenarios would you use or when you are looking for documents that contain either one or two search terms, when you want to exclude a specific term from your search results, when you want to narrow down your search documents and contain all your search terms? D, when you want to find documents containing the exact phrase. I feel okay with that, actually. We can even try the slightly longer one. Let's see if we get something different. You are an instructional designer. Create a quiz question that requires students to demonstrate an understanding of the Boolean operator or offering three, whoops, offering three wrong, I don't know if that's my own mistake, but we'll not worry about it, answers and one right answer to choose from. Let's see if we get different things. I mean, I did feel pretty good about the first one. So which of the following correctly describes the use of or, or is used to exclude. So we're getting slightly different. We're saying like the first one, it seemed like it was more 
based around just when you'd use it and that's saying or is used. I mean, very similar. And then finally, how should I ask students to use the Boolean operator or maybe not terribly interesting just to watch me type, but I'm curious. And interesting. So it's a bit more of like a paragraph type thing. So different options that we might try out. Uh, also keep active because it doesn't really matter. Slideshow. Just see if any new answers came in. I'm not sure. I might have actually blocked everyone. Um, so yeah, I guess I'm curious. Are there elements of your library's educational program that you could see yourself using AI for? Oh, let's see. There's a thing in the chat. Who has access? So people at NYU have access, or at, people at NYU Langone who've signed a user rights agreement have access to that. So basically, Langone has entered an agreement to with Microsoft to have sort of a, or not sort of, to have explicitly a HIPAA compliant version and private business pr private version uh, of ChatGPT that is not communicating information out. Uh, and so it's sort of the internal to NYU uh, version. It's not actually as up to date in terms of its material. It's sort of the paid chat GPT, as in if you go to open AI and pay, I think that goes up to 2023 at this point. I think the Langone one's still at 2021 or whenever it was. Um, so yeah, the, it's basically an internal system. Um, so maybe it would be more helpful in this context to be going to general open AI. I've kind of just gotten in the use case. Uh, let's see, you could use AI to write scripts for uh, PowerPoint presentations. Yeah, I mean, uh, that totally, yeah. I mean, outlining your course or even providing a script. Whoop, I'm gonna, this is going faster than I expected. So yeah, brainstorming topics, I think huge. Uh, let's see, structuring ideas for information page, live guides. And yeah, I mean, you should, I mean, obviously you don't really have access to them, but the my colleague, <laughs> David, is really, I'm just a, in awe of the degree to which he's pushed the live guide format to it. <laughs> it's like... Uh, to the max of what it can do in terms of adding in these things like brainstorming, but also adding in features that like normally would have required too much coding for sort of a non-coder, non-web developer. Let's see, creating elementary or adult level programming topics. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I mean, spending time telling people not to use it for literature searches and like, it's not a literature search. Certainly ChatGPT is not searching the web. So you have that challenge. And then even if you are using a tool like site.ai or like perplexity, or I forget what the third one somebody mentioned was, you know, there's still a limited amount of literature databases there. You still need to be your, uh, you know, your thorough library searcher, at least, you know, we always tell people three databases. Um, so it's definitely not gonna do that. And if you just said, okay, provide me the literature on X, it's gonna be totally wrong. And you have this huge risk of errors. So. Definitely a challenge there, but I think everyone here probably has experienced that. And probably at this point, it's just a matter of getting people to understand that like, it's not replacing your PubMed. It's, you know, maybe replacing your first draft writing. Like it can be helpful for writing out a draft, but it's not really replacing anything. Like you still have to, you know, assess it and proofread it and so on. Let's see, writing class descriptions. Oh yeah, for like, if you're promoting things, that can also be a huge, just that email messaging or if it's, you know, an image online can also be uh, good. Let's see. Let's see. I'm just reading through the chat. Uh, still review for accuracy. Found Gen AI helpful in summarizing complex literature. And it could also be nice. I mean, we with our, or I with, I teach a class for our, PhD students in rigor and reproducibility. And we've sort of dipped our toe into how might we like add this to our critical appraisal steps. So like find quickly finding things like the end of the study, what they've said on, you know, about the blinding can be beneficial as well as uh, I have a colleague here, uh, Dr. Chris Requarth, who teaches a workshop on writing things. And so you can even say, you know, according to the ARRIVE guidelines, which is a guideline on animal studies, you know, what am I missing in this method section? And it can do a reasonably okay job to help you kind of proofread and improve things. Let's see, tried to write a tutorial script for AMA style. Uh, not as successful, it shows what, yeah, I mean, sometimes you get you can get there by getting the opposite of what you want. Uh, let's see. Let's see, I'm just reading. 
explain this topic. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I, I personally do not work a ton with scripts. <laughs> it's not apparent from my rambling, uh, rambling, incoherent methods of speaking and teaching. Uh, I'm not a big script user, so, but those who have had experience can definitely speak to that. Yeah, writing reference letters, let's say. Okay, so a lot of different use cases. Okay, so we also use it a bit in terms of data analysis and systems work. Uh, so you could definitely use this in the context of helping to generate code. Uh, so I and my colleague, uh, Dr. Elisa Circus here, who's done a lot with sort of information on the usage sets, uh, have worked to, uh, you know, have found it to be helpful with just providing the code in the sense of, you know, if we're analyzing our data in R, we don't necessarily remember things, how to do certain things. It can be nice and beneficial there. Definitely, this is an area where we've both encountered the challenge of, um, what's the term, uh, system drift. So system drift is this concept that over time, some of these AI systems may be getting worse. So I will definitely say months and months ago, I found it to be much more helpful with providing me some of those suggestions for our code. And so this might be things, you know, like going from like the wide to the long format, which basically is just two different ways you might have a, a, a spreadsheet of information. And so there are ways that might be easier for you to understand, but it's a little bit confusing how you go from the one to the other. If you don't know what I'm talking about, it doesn't really matter too much. Just keep in mind, there's different ways you might have your spreadsheet sort of designed and laid out. And it can be nice to sort of use the AI systems to say, okay, this is a tip for the code. So again, it's not really that different from going to Stack Overflow or one of these coding sites, but it can be a little bit faster and like a little bit less like sifting through a bunch of message board things that are all like kind of close to what you want, but not quite there. So I find it can be really nice to have those uh, as they kind of go. Let's see, I'm just seeing, in order to ask a chatbot questions about an article, can you drag and drop a PDF? So there's a way you can do, if you've paid OpenAI ChatGPT, and I'm not, I'll definitely freely admit, I'm not super up on the differences of all of the different AI systems, especially because I'm just sort of like, you know, our context, like we just tell people to use the internal one for, um, you know, security reasons. Uh, so I can't really speak to all the different versions, but I do know there is a way, if you have the paid, like you've paid $20 a month or whatever it is, that you can do a PDF upload, uh, I've heard it's not that good with spreadsheets, but that, you know, your mileage may vary type thing. But so there are services and systems you can do that in. So you couldn't do that, I think, like in free chat GPT. Um, so just things to be aware of. The different tools may uh, have that help or may not. Um, so yeah, so I mentioned it can save you some time in finding these solutions as opposed to going to other sites. But it definitely requires a fair amount of troubleshooting and customization. And yeah, as I just mentioned, you can have this issue of the model drift that can really create issues or getting worse issues over time. I might actually jump past this one because I think actually the next portion might be the more interesting, uh, more interesting portion. Uh, so some things around literature review. So I'm kind of leaning heavily on the uh, on the literature <laughs> on on you know how libraries are using this a bit. So yeah, there's a fair amount of interest in papers talking about this. So uh, Jimenez et al. in 2022, and it's very possible that I am mispronouncing the author's names, which I think perhaps we're all as librarians very familiar with uh, mispronouncing things that we've only read. I just learned from some residents that I've been saying some aglutide incorrectly. So uh, not that that's relevant to AI, but if I'm mispronouncing these, my mistake. Uh, so yeah, they did a review, and this was, of course, a year before ChatGPT was publicly released, uh, and they found that there were, they they did a review, they found 63 uh, tools, 119 discussions of their use. So just in general, it really highlights that there's this huge amount of interest, and they do different sorts of things. I do not recall how any of them did in terms of, you know, the outcomes, uh, but it can definitely be something to be aware of that there are a lot of these tools for, they're really talking about in the context of the systematic review process. Um, so a paper from last year, Qureshi et al., they were really talking about ChatGPT, noting that it was very much in its infancy, which I would say is still the case, it's at, at most in its toddlerhood. 
Uh, and I think it's a big open question of how it might be used. Definitely, I think it could be helpful to people in terms of proposing inclusion and exclusion criteria. It might also be helpful to individuals who maybe are a little bit less conversant in the PICO format, saying like, how do we get this into a nice framework, you know, a nice answerable question uh, for, for working with our information. Um, though they also note things around for your analysis, though you'd still need expert help. Um, and I'll say, I mean, they talk about non-expert searching. I personally, and <laughs> I feel like it's like, well, I'm a librarian, so I don't need that help. And I, but I suspect everyone on the line is like, well, yeah, we can write a search that's better than what ChatGPT can produce. We've all noted, somebody noted that it's pretty bad, uh, you know, at suggesting mesh terms. And it's pretty mediocre at terms in general, though it may be able to get the ball rolling for somebody who maybe doesn't have access to a librarian or doesn't have the familiarity with doing a search. Uh, but yeah, there's also, they discuss that there are potentials for some reason, but there is of course the risk of errors. And as we've noted the various synonyms for, um, for uh, hallucinations, that you do have this issue that you still need to, at the end of the day, be doing the you know top level human review if you're going to be somewhere, especially if it's for something like a systematic review, which we're assuming is going to have, you know, this high level of evidence uh, going into it. Uh, so another review, 2022, again, free chat GPT. They were looking at the use of AI in screening in a systematic review. Uh, and they found that th this was a review paper looking at review papers. And they found that, you know, a fair amount, there were concerns that they may have missed titles or mischaracterized studies, or there may have been issues in data extraction. Um, and, but they also note that that's a problem when you have the two human screeners, that you have one person might disagree with the other. That's why you've got that third tiebreaker person. And uh, as well as having the, you know, the two people do the review. So it's very possible that maybe having one person review and one person be the AI essentially could save time if you still have that step of essentially duplicate review. And they did find that in their paper, looking at papers, looking at reviews using AI, many of the people in their study found that it did really help reduce workloads and expedite review times. And I'll definitely note, this is something that's very of interest here at Langone and elsewhere. Uh, I and my colleagues are very interested in, you know, could we use this to help with the screening steps? Uh, just a question from Rosemary, if there are free AI tools worth using for systematic reviews, that's a great question, and I just do not know the answer. Uh, I think it's probably soon to say. The other thing is, um, a colleague of mine, Greg Lanor, was just doing a presentation for the MLA Systematic Review Caucus, or maybe it's not the Systematic Review Caucus, but it's he was doing a presentation on systematic reviews and AIs. A lot of these tools, there may be open source ones that if you have the coding experience, you could go to their uh, GitHub and you can download and you can try them out. I can't, I really can't speak to if they're if they're worth giving a try. But just be aware that they may, if they are, if they're free, they may entail a fair amount of expertise to kind of stand up. Uh, let's see. There's a question about illicit. We explored illicit a little here, but as somebody noted before, the limitation of being only open open access journals, which I'm not mentioning, you know, to weigh into the whole open access, you know, sort of like political debate, which is not something that terribly interests me. But I mean, it was just missing such a huge body of the uh you know of the literature let's see and alex notes yeah if it's a black box system then you're you're not really being systematic uh in your judgments so fair fair counterpoint to uh the the system yeah and reproducibility i think remains a huge challenge uh with these ai systems especially since they are you know uh what's the word like stochastic systems they don't it's not like one piece in one piece out it's like there's a a degree of randomness within the system. So yeah, great, great point to all of these. Um, that said, I mean, we could also note that systems like our search search tools do keep changing how the algorithms in the back end of kind of PubMed work. You know, there is a degree of update and change over time. So it always is going to be kind of entail a certain degree of 
documentation as your approach to uh, to reproducibility as opposed to uh, what's the word like true results, true computational reproducibility. I mean, this is a I I I've alluded to teaching a class with our uh, PhD students. It's actually a class on reproducibility, so you may have <laughs> hit upon something that I like to talk and think about. But yeah, no, I think it's like a great point. Could we could we make these reproducible? And what kinds of reproducibility are we talking about? Because on the one hand, yeah, like you're you're not going to get the same results necessarily each time you do it. But that's also true just due to a the shift in the things we're searching and b the algorithms of the search. So the same language might provide different types of results over time. The depending on you know how the algorithms they use, we're going to get different things over time. So I think to a certain extent, we may have to just there may be benefits and trade-offs to sort of saying, okay, we don't have a true computationally reproducible. We're not getting the same results that we got. But, you know, within the mitigated pragmatic constraint of, okay, but we can also save our researchers a ton of time and we can still document our, our work so others can both, you know, reproduce it in the sense of follow the same steps or for that matter, they can understand and say how reliable does their work seem to be it may be worth considering. So all different sorts of concerns in tension with one another. Um, let's see. Yeah, I think that sounds like a great class as well, Hannah. Uh, I suspect it's very emerging. Uh, and thank you to Heather for posting Greg's, uh, Greg's class. I got to see the sort of like uh, trial run. So I know it's a great class. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I mean, there are already plenty of badly conducted uh, systematic reviews in the literature. And it's very likely, I mean, it'll definitely be a continuing problem uh, within, you know, AI or no AI, it's probably going to continue to be a huge problem. I mean, all of us have seen papers where it's like barely a, a like a, barely a narrative review. And they're like, we did a systematic review. And you're like, did you? But neither here nor there. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Uh, so uh, Michelle Colley down at, I want to say UNC, uh, she has a book chapter describing their use of AI actually in uh, reviews. They, uh, she's specifically talking about uh, more machine learning models. So they were working on this before ChatGPT was present. Uh, and they were really talking in about using it. They were using it in kind of a few different ways. So she mentions uh, one thing was identifying clusters of possibly relevant uh, literature. So part of the challenge was, you know, in very large, not specific searches, they might be getting lots of, you know, not relevant results. And so using these tools to maybe help them hone in their search terms a little bit. So I know in the chapter, they mention things around something in the realm of veterinary science and that by using their machine learning approach, they realized that certain terms were more likely to pull in some types of articles about animals that were just not relevant to their search and they could just sort of cut out that portion. Uh, they also talk about using these models for prioritizing what are the most likely to be relevant articles. So when they have truly massive um, amounts of literature, you know, providing kind of the likely articles up front to those uh, researchers. Um, so yeah, they there's definitely it's a worthwhile article to check out. I believe it is actually fully open access. Uh, but yeah, they note that if researchers are going to be using these machine learning methods, these AI methods, it's really important that they have the domain experts to be able to apply the technology effectively. And really, I think, and I agree, I mean, I guess it's obvious I agree because I wouldn't have put it here, but I agree that academic librarians really do have this opportunity to work with these research teams to provide that subject matter expertise around the bibliographic data. So if we believe as is I think a fair fair expectation that researchers may be looking to use generative AI methods or machine learning methods on reviews and on systematic reviews. It's really important for librarians to be conversant in these methods and really important for them to be involved in projects to provide the best possible results. So to Alex and others' points around reproducibility, you know, really walking through, you know, what are the sort of uh, tensions that exist from a reproducibility standpoint. How do we report and make you know it clear what we've done so others can follow a similar methodology and at least make sense of our methodology uh, and 
on that basis sort of make the informed decisions about you know what are likely to be beneficial results what are likely to be not you know or not beneficial results but like what are likely to be solid findings in a systematic review what are likely maybe not methodologically rigorous systematic reviews so it's really important i think just to underscore there really is a in my opinion an important role for librarians to sort of engage with these challenges engage with researchers uh to you know help navigate these tensions which i think are probably certainly unresolvable i think they always exist these tensions of the pragmatic challenges versus the you know most methodologically rigorous challenges i think like a current you know ever present example not involving ai would be you know do you include the non english um abstracts and like the by the book best practice of course is yes but we all know and have experienced that sometimes it's just not pragmatically there's no funding for translations so the, those are excluded and that does make the results of the paper less reliable and less generalizable and so it's just sort of thinking how do these similar sorts of discussions how might they factor in in the systematic review universe um, again, 2023, Dos Santos et al., so they've noted a, a market increase uh, in the use of AI, and they find it in the area of collecting articles, which, again, does, of course, give me pause. They're not, this paper isn't to <laughs> provide the recommendation, but there is this, you know, this challenge in finding relevant materials. You know, it's not very good as, it's certainly not a search engine, and it's often challenging, though it could be okay for generating that first list of important synonyms, as well as mining data and uh, quality assurance. So they noted less quality assurance within their uh, in their review. Uh, so yeah, so there's also a variety of papers describing specific tools out there. So I think somebody earlier asked about open source tools or free open access tools, uh, that there can be these benefits both for uh, categorizing the literature, and they do note that both human and AI system review tools miss themes that the others identified, which I think, again, just sort of underscores the need to at least have, uh, you know, you wouldn't be replacing any degree of human review. It might be the case where you're replacing one of the reviewers in terms of things. So one one human reviewer to check and compare to an AI reviewer, I could definitely see being something that makes sense, at least to me. Uh, but it is sort of a question of, you know, both the human reviewers tend to make, you know, will make mistakes, the AI reviewers make mistakes. And so how can these be most effectively combined to both save time, but also ensure rigorous and reliable uh, results? So yeah, another paper similarly looking at a review tool. Um, they were talking about this tool called AS Review, used for screening. They, and this, I think, is a huge limitation of this paper. They didn't actually evaluate for uh, the accuracy of the screen, is my understanding. Uh, but they provided, they looked at, you know, if they provide it with a certain amount of uh, training articles, three relevant, three irrelevant, uh, that they did a, I think my memory was that they found it did a relatively solid job at reviewing the um reviewing the papers and screening as they went through. So yeah, so it seems like people have a lot of thoughts <laughs> and I am definitely curious about all of your thoughts about the use of AI in the lit review process. So it could be the general lit review process. It could be the um, systematic review process. Um, but yeah, I'm very curious. Don't at all, or is that don't at all, or is that don't and then accidentally? Um, I mean, it's certainly, yeah, I'm curious. What do others say? I mean, to my mind, I would be worried providing my users with that kind of advice might just drive them away. Um, I feel like it's too, to me, it's too, uh, yeah, too broad. I, again, I also probably wouldn't want to, if my memory of Latin phrases, caveat emptor, buyer beware is my memory. If that's not, then somebody chime in. But I would really want to keep things a little bit more conversational. Um, yeah, because I think that there is the reality that our, certainly in the case of our students, there's a lot of interest in using these tools. Uh, I think that our faculty, at least here, it really, uh, really runs the gamut. Uh, and I'm really interested. I kind of want to do 
a look at trying these tools. Uh, what do you call it? trying these tools to try out, see how it does in terms of screening and things. But that, of course, belies my own interest. Um, let's see. Yeah, but I mean, they're mostly not search tools. And I think it's really important to keep that conversation, you know, clear that they're not searching online, that they, I mean, some to a certain extent, Bing chat can pull things online. Uh, but again, not really scholarly resources. Some of these, uh, some of these, uh, what do you call it? More scholarly oriented tools. Uh, I think there was perplexity, elicit, site.ai. They they are pulling from uh, the literature. So it could be something to be aware of in terms of, you know, ways you might approach. Let's see, if you use it to help you think, fine. If you use a search, let's see. Could be useful in identifying search terms, abstract screening. Let's see, semantic scholar pulls the literature. Uh, let's see, a lot of potential to introduce bias into the review process when used extensively for screening. It can help speed the process up, but researchers need to double check. Yeah, I definitely think it's a really important to always have somebody double checking the work. Um, yeah, and it's probably also the case that there will be people who misuse it, create searches. And I think that's probably a case where you really want to, to my mind, that point. So this person says there's a lot of researchers who may use it by conducting literature searches that aren't comprehensive. And I think that's really an argument for keeping these conversations with our researchers going and open, uh, because I think that many do not really understand the finer points of the literature or the literature databases. M many might not also understand the, uh, what do you call it, the finer points of the how the various AI tools may or may not, in my experience, may not be interacting with databases and tools. So it can really be challenging there. Let's see. Um, let's see. I haven't found it for lit reviews, but maybe just lack of experience. And I mean, I'll also know, I personally have not used it in lit reviews in any context. Though I do have colleagues who've really taken a deep dive into these tools like site.ai and perplexity. And actually for that matter, I was doing a literature consult with somebody who was interested in one of the AI enhanced lit search databases, site.ai, and they were really blown away by the results. So for that user, they found using a, and that's like a case where there's like a chat interface, but then there's you know an actual corpus of literature that it's going into. They found being able to do essentially a natural language search really beneficial to them. And I got the impression that they would come back. I have a feeling that that's probably the future, but you know, predicting the future is a, it's like a, you know, a, a mugs game. Like who knows what the future will really be. Uh, let's see, being aware that the journals are aware. Let's see, it dampens or stops the desire for perceived need to learn for students. I mean, is that, I don't know, that could be true. I, that's not been my own personal, but it is very possible that there are risks that way. Let's see. Going down, identifying search terms, and just reviewing what people have said, maybe for screening. Yeah, I mean, the challenge of somebody said grad students doing a review as a semester project, though, granted, that's like an ongoing thing. And I remember reading an article, I think, in JMLA a while ago, where it was somebody saying that, like, you know, they didn't really, they didn't, I think, get a publication out of it, but they did find that working with students to explain the review process, they were able to teach quite a bit, even though like from the standpoint of like, what is a good review, the the students or residents in question really get there. But there's, you know, there's, there's use cases with uh, all these tools. Let's see, the chat is also blowing up. Let's see. Yeah, <laughs> hard to get pursued people to proofread their own work, let alone check with the AI systems. I mean, I think to the question of if it's faster than reviewing on your, if you have to review everything, is it faster? I think that can really vary for person to person. Like I definitely know people who, for whom it is faster to review something that's written than to write something from zero. But that is, yeah, there are these challenges. Let's see. Users get missed very different from different systems which of course is why we tell everyone to work with multiple things and just sort of reviewing. Yeah, always it will be important to have the rigor and critical analysis skills. Let's see. 
uh, let's see, Anne O'Connor notes, you know, providing the caveats and the challenges alongside the, the fun new tools can be interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of interest. Okay, well, excellent. So all things to think about as we work with our communities uh, <laughs> to sort of change pace a little bit. So yeah, definitely can, as we've noted, be useful for uh, for summarizing feedback. So in terms of more like keeping <laughs> the library running, can be useful for, for example, if we're getting user feedback, valuation forms. I know in our library, when a person submits a library question to the ticketing system, which I think is Lib Answers, I believe it sends a, you know, how did the live, how did that go after it's been closed? It can be nice to like, if you have a bunch of these results, you can of course read through them and you want to do some quality checking, but it can be nice, especially if it's like not, you know, essential, if it's not like a life or day matter, if it's a relatively low intensity, issue, it can be really nice to summarize this information. I also have colleagues who uh, have used it to summarize meeting notes and do a short executive summary, which can often be a challenge, especially when working with long, you know, complex meetings with lots of people talking. So it can be nice to sort of, if they're just taking the notes as it goes, essentially saying this person said this and this person said this, turning it into something a little bit more presentable. Definitely heard that use case around as a very possible option for making library work a little bit easier. Let's see. Uh, yeah, and helping to improve the tone. Uh, I've definitely heard, you know, a lot of people note this, that sometimes, uh, for example, if they're trying to provide constructive feedback, providing that script to make it a little bit less intense. Uh, I've also heard of people trying to, you know, when they have expertise, subject matter expertise, provide things in a more uh, plain language example. I know I've done that uh, in terms of providing simplified information. Um, but yeah, so it's definitely a, uh, a a way you can sort of do that translation into simpler terms. So just providing an example, please revert the following in a friendly cheerful language at a high school reading level. Uh, I mean, I, I did this, I was participating in the NCDS's data glossary. We were trying to, we went back and forth trying to define data bias or LLM bias, something about bias. And uh, <laughs> As you can imagine, there's it was really hard to explain it in a way that wasn't like, didn't sound like a bunch of nerds <laughs> writing to themselves. And so having the, the GPT actually translate it in the more like generally approachable language, I think was beneficial and very helpful and saved us a lot of time and actually at minimum saved us a lot of headaches of going back and forth and arguing what was the best way to phrase things. So it was helpful once we knew that the information we wanted was there to put it in things in simpler terms. I've also heard of this in terms of, you know, people wanting to get a slightly more understandable approach to medical language, you know, less less scientifically jargon driven. Um, there are definitely, of course, issues. If it's going to be saying that's patient facing, that's a huge challenge there. And like you want to think about all the ramifications, but it can just be nice for sort of rewording materials. Okay, just reading through the chat. So yeah, just some quick challenges and issues before we wrap up today. Uh, the So yeah, so of course, as many people have noted, these systems do have blind spots uh, for really anything. It could be when screening literature, it could be course designs. And so it's really always going to be important to maintain that human reviewer. There may also be legal concerns. So we talked about this idea of using it for screening material. Uh, but of course, I know if I was to go to the legal office here, I'm 100% certain because I've heard them say as much, you know, you could not enter information that's related to your research into the system, because then you're essentially broadcasting your research out into an open system, if that makes sense. Um, and so, yeah, something to think about in terms of will it be secure? If you're using a secured internal system, that's one thing, but like you wouldn't want to put your paper into chat GPT because then you're essentially publishing it before you've published it. And that may, you know, impact your institution's policies. It may impact legal concerns. And of course, if it's a public system, you'd never want anything with HIPAA, though I suspect many of us here do not necessarily do tons with HIPAA. And of course, we mentioned you may get worse results over time. So to Alex's points around reproducibility with this issue of um, model drift, you may get, you know, worse results of it's doing a task such as a screening thing. Uh, and so, yeah, we mentioned 
Uh, I mentioned uh, earlier the uh, issue just in coding and getting code advice, but certainly if you're doing something more and like really bit bringing it into your search process, it might also create challenges. So I'm going to do a quick, hopefully, <laughs> knock on wood, review, and then we will uh, call it a day and Peace will give you the information on the course survey. So again, using the same system, uh, some libraries are using AI and resource discovery by creating natural language catalog searches, having AI write catalog entries wholesale, uh, and using AI to classify resources. <laughs> yeah, I see Liz's question. What happens when somebody puts PHI into Google? Uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> they, I guess they get audited if, if it works correctly. I mean, we can all surmise that somewhere somebody right now is doing something inappropriate with PHI. Yeah, so people are using it to uh, catalog, uh, create natural language cataloging searches. Um, I don't know of anybody who's writing the catalog entries in their entirety, but just things to think about. I'm going to jump forward one. So yeah, so maybe if we're analyzing our usage statistics, could we use AI to read in spreadsheets? Spread that to read in spreadsheets and develop a linear model. Would we use it to suggest? code to help analyze statistics or suggest a course of action? What what would you say is a good use case for AI here? Letting the things go. Yeah, I mean, I would recommend it for suggesting code to help analyze. I would, I, to my knowledge, you, at least as of right now, it is not possible to read in a spreadsheet and develop a, a model on the basis of it. It's just not designed that way. And in general, I mean, famously, they're pretty bad at math in general, but helping you to suggest to the code to work, I think can be really, uh, beneficial. Let's see. And then uh, when creating library classes and workshops, Gen AI may be used to recruit participants, research up-to-date cutting-edge topics, help generate quiz questions. Yeah, I find myself wondering, maybe you could help generate ideas for recruitment materials now that I've put this here. Um, so you could definitely help to generate ad language. Though in my experience, it needs a lot of tweaking. It tends to be kind of Mm, cheesy, <laughs> if that's a better, if that's a fair way to phrase it. Okay, and so then in systematic reviews, has AI been used to replace library and searchers effect effectively? Help screen abstracts to rank for relevance. Help group abstracts by concepts. Oh, it does occur to me that these will move. I didn't think of that when I wrote the question. Uh, help group abstracts by concepts and identify common resources. So yeah, will be B and C. People have been using it to try to rank if things are relevant, as well as looking through things and saying, oh, are there common, you know, keyword themes? If we're getting a lot, if we have a super non-specific search, uh, you know, can that help there? Let's see. Is this? I believe this is my last question. We're not doing a breakout activity, which is fine with me. The work cited will be here. The slides will be sent out. Uh, so. I do want to really thank you all so much uh, for joining today. I think there was some fun conversation. It was certainly fun for me. Thanks for watching. This video was produced by the network of the National Library of Medicine. Select the circular channel icon to subscribe to our channel, or select a video thumbnail to watch another video from the channel.